All right. Good day, everyone. I hope that you are doing well. Um, I want to take this time to apologize for not being able to be present in class this week. Um, I have something that I need to do out of town that was scheduled before uh, the class kind of got organized. Uh, but nonetheless, we are going to have the lecture virtually online through this recording. And we will review everything just as if we were in class. So let's begin by talking about what's due this week. So naturally, you have your chapter 14 quiz, which is the 25 questions based from the chapter. Uh, you also have, based upon the course schedule, the cloud computing proposal assignment. And just a little bit of detail about that. We talked about it briefly in class last week. Uh, so basically, it is an assignment where you serve as an IT professional in a small business and management has tasked you with reviewing the following cloud solutions and proposing one for implementation within your organization. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of editing to this because, as I noted here, examples include but are not limited to. So you have G Suite by Google Cloud. You have the OneDrive for business and you have Dropbox for business. Management is requesting that you research the above cloud solutions and make a recommendation on which cloud solution would be best for your organization. Alternatively, as discussed in class, you may also argue that a data solution may be best for your organization. So basically, you want to go in and identify different cloud solutions, figure out the pros and cons of each, and be prepared to communicate that. So you're going to do it just as we talked about before. We're going to do it as a proposal first, and then you'll do it as a presentation. The big thing about this is remember that your audience is non-technical. So if you start talking about encryption and things like that, they're not going to understand. Think about it from the perspective of if a non-technical user was getting ready to use this cloud solution, how would they benefit from it? And that's the perspective that you want to take on as you write your proposal and as you make your presentation. Um, so a couple of points here. Uh, you can read those at your leisure. These are things that you want to consider in the grading. The big key here is you're going to prepare a proposal, a three-page maximum outlining your recommendations. So which one that you choose, why is it important, and remember it's from a non-technical perspective. Also, because we don't have class this week, uh, I have to give an assignment that basically documents attendance for this week's class. Uh, so what will happen is you have this practice assignment. I believe it's 20 questions, two attempts. Uh, let me double check that. Yes, so 20 questions, two attempts. Basically, it's just going to be just like your quizzes. So in essence, you're going to go through, it's going to be based on the three chapters that could be considered or that'll be a part of this exam. Uh, so you'll want to go ahead and take that seriously. It counts as an assignment, not a quiz. So you'll take that, complete that, and that will be submitted as well. So this is all the work that you have due for this upcoming week. And as normal, it is due by the 27th, which is Wednesday at 1159. If you have any questions, by all means, feel free to email me and I will quickly respond to your email. So let's deep dive into chapter 14, which is writing for business. So I'm going to make this full screen here so that we can discuss it. And let me get my book open. So I've got my resources here and... I've got a and get ready to go through these slides. So a big component of this chapter, as you have done or, and, and as you have realized, uh, you do a lot of writing in business settings, um, proposals, documents, how to guides. All of these are things that are, we're responsible within an IT organization, FAQs. You the, the sky is the limit in terms of what we do in preparation for 
all of these various types of medias. And so because of that, we have to be ready uh, to write and to write with two varying audiences. So the objectives for this chapter report some of the factors that make good business writing, examine how appropriate use of technology and email at the workplace enhances the image of the organization, describe how to write effective and appropriate business letters, and illustrate procedures and formats for different types of business documents. So let's go ahead and get started with the first objective here. And I've got my slides printed out here, so give me a moment, let me get organized and with you. So we're gonna first of all talk about developing business writing skills. So one of the first things that we have to do is as we begin uh, talking about drafting a document, we have to organize what it is that we're creating. Um, and that can be done in a couple of different manners. The first one is problem solution. So with problem solution, what we essentially do is we identify this is the problem. The problem is that users are experiencing issues uh, logging into their computers. And then these are possible solutions. So it could be that the network cable is unplugged. It could be um, that the computer is having issues with the domain. So you want to identify and give an overview of the problem, give a description of what the problem is, and then write out different solutions that may resolve that particular problem. And that would be a problem solution document. The second type of document is chronological, which is essentially what it sounds like. So when you think about chronological, you think of step by step. Here's step number one, here's step number two, so on and so forth. So we use chronological to do sequential development um, so that we have an organized manner for going through all of our steps. We have items that go from um, probably high priority to low priority, uh, but we're more so, because priority is the next one, but we're more so focused on just giving an order in a sense. The third option is priority. And so with priority, you talk about what's urgent first, and then you go down the list. So typically an agenda for a meeting is something that works with this because you go from high priority to what's least important. You want to spend the most time on your high priority options and things that aren't as high priority. Uh, you may spend less time on them or if they get pushed to you know, next, then they're not necessarily as major of a focus. Then you have general to specific. So with general to specific, you're starting with the with the big picture and then you're walking through it. So process smaller details later. You want to start with kind of a general overview and you grow and get more specific as things kind of go through the midst. So you're going to in most cases, you're going to start organizing your document into what is most sensible for what I'm trying to produce within this particular document. Then we talk about what is considered appropriate style. So when we deal with style, there are a lot of things that come into play. A uh, perfect example is tone, language, voice, or overall viewpoint of sentences. Um, certain things may be more appropriate in terms of tone with our friends than they would be with people we are uh, having a business relationship with. I can be more joking and have a more joking demeanor when I'm having a conversation with my friends when I'm having or doing some type of writing that's going out in a professional sense, I don't want to have that. So there are differences in all of these things. The second thing is language. When it comes to language and when you're writing for business, you want to use professional language. But you also want to use language that corresponds with what they're describing. Perfect example, I think we've all seen documents that have been written and you know some of the language that is used within the document doesn't align with what they're describing, particularly verbiage. And so all of that is important uh, as you consider. Voice, um, voice can be perceived from writing, and that's important because people think that voice is not 
uh, something that corresponds with writing, but in actuality, it really does. So when you talk about voice, um, one of the things that you want to really focus on is understanding who you're writing to. And you want to use things that are that convey that. Um, when you talk about voice and your textbook goes into uh, this kind of differently, because when it talks about writing appropriately with style, it talks about using appropriate tone and vocabulary. And the definitional points that it talks about is why am I writing this document? Who am I writing it to? And what do I want them to understand? What kind of tone will complement and reinforce my written message? Um, so those are things that are important when you look at the first two. And then when you uh, start talking about tone, you want to be confident, be courteous and sincere, adapt to the reader by stressing benefits and write at the appropriate level of difficulty. And that's important, particularly with the big takeaway from this class is because you have to consider that every audience that you write to may not be technical. Whereas other audiences, you may be writing to someone within your team and you can use jargon and all those types of things and it would be appropriate. Then you have what's called biased language, which biased language comes into play. First of all, let's talk about what biased messages are. So biased messages includes words and expressions that offend people because they make inappropriate assumptions or repeat stereotypes about gender, ethnicity, physical ment or mental disability, age, or sexual orientation. So when it comes to um, language, we wanna make sure that we're using things that are unbiased. So for example, you don't want, in, in, in more traditional language, it was common to use the word he when you're talking about um, gender, but you don't want to use generic he. You want to be more specific because though things like this can be offensive. Um, you want to avoid inappropriate words and expressions, and you want to avoid inappropriate assumptions or repeating stereotypes. And so all of that is important when you talk about writing with appropriate style. Next, you want to avoid or you want to make sure that you write with clarity. So when you talk about writing with clarity, there's a few things that you want to take into consideration. The first thing when you talk about clarity is you want to think about the specificity of the message. What is it specifically supposed to say? You want to think about the comprehension of the message. You want to think about the choice of appropriate words. And this next one is important. You want to avoid jargon. Because for as much as you may think is staying internal to a department or whatever the case may be, you can't make the assumption that everyone's clear on the jargon that you will use. So for that reason, you want to avoid jargon as much as possible. And you want to make sure that you are concise. There's a couple of other things that your book is going to talk about. And it talks about subordination. So instead of it, their textbook says, and we received the sales report this afternoon, it was five pages. The report clearly illustrated a drop in sales market-wide. Subordinate using conjunctions to combine the ideas from these sentences to make one coherent sentence. So if you think about it, it's kind of choppy. You have to read a lot in order to, to understand what it's talking about. So put it all together, make it concise. This afternoon, we received the five-page sales report which clearly illustrates a market-wide drop in sales. And so when we talk about subordination, that's one of the things that I really try to stress in this class uh, because when you're writing and when you're submitting documents, particularly for review, length is good in certain settings. But in certain settings, they want to get an understanding of what it is that you're trying to convey so that they can understand the general message and move forward. And so when you understand that, then it really becomes imperative with in terms of who your audience is. So subordination is important. You want to avoid redundancy. And this is very important. Redundancy, first of all, makes the report look bad, but then it eliminates qualifying terms. Um, 
So even if you're not repeating whole phrases and sentences, a report can still be redundant. Um, so you want to avoid using terms such as first and foremost or basic and fundamental. Just just stick to what it is that you're trying to do. You know, the, the reader's going to understand first and foremost. Uh, so you don't have to utilize terminology like that because it gets redundant in the eyes of the reader. Next, you don't want to overutilize intensifiers. You really don't want to, you really want to make sure uh, you don't want to do that. A good example is the report was perfectly clear and completely accurate. All you have to do is leave that with the report is clear and accurate because you have the adjective to describe it. The intensifiers just make it long and kind of overbearing in a sense. And then you want to avoid telegraphic language. Um, telegraphic style condenses a written message by eliminating articles, pronouns, conjunctions, and transitions. So in your textbook on page 313, if you have the, or sorry, 213, if you have the physical text, it gives an example of telegraphic style and, and clear message because it's not included on the slides. I can't really share it, uh, but it says per May 5th memo meeting agenda attached. Supervisor wants to re wants report by Houston office meeting as soon as report received. August almost full. Please advise to set date. Um, and so that's not really a clear message. If I'm jotting down notes for myself, that may be that may be good, but that's not good in terms of writing and sending it out to others. So you want to clarify that by saying, as mentioned in my May 5th memo, I have attached the next meeting agenda. The supervisor wants the report to be completed by the Houston office. As soon as we get the report, we can schedule a meeting. Our August calendar is almost full, so please suggest a date soon. And so these are things that you want to make sure you do to ensure that you're writing with clarity. We'll jump into our second objective here, which talks about technology and email. Um, and so when we talk about technology and email, um, it's important that we understand that we need to use technology effectively. Um, technology is good, and we all are passionate about technology. We're in an IT program. Uh, but technology can only be good if it's used effectively. Um, so first of all, we want to look at what are the methods of communication um, and understand the methods of communication within our organization. When you deal with methods of communication, you're talking about media richness or how closely a technology simulates face-to-face -face communication. And so our goal is to do more that simulates face-to-face. -face. So this is why you're seeing um, a drive in voice over IP communication, particularly ser services like WebEx and Zoom, where you're able to see the person just as well as communicate with them. And so because you're able to do that, that becomes a media-rich item because it simulates true face-to-face -face technology or face-to-face -face interaction. And so that is important. And the more media rich um, something is, the more effective it can be, particularly in certain work environments. So with methods of communication, you have writing and face-to-face. -face. With media richness, we talk about the role of technology and it's we consider something rich when instant feedback is allowed. So if I'm able to communicate, so this would be, for example, technology that does not, that is not as media rich as um, a WebEx session, because I, though I can record and share uh, the slides with you and share the lecture with you, I can't get immediate feedback. We can't have discussion. Whereas if we were in a WebEx setting, that would be more media wit rich because as we're having, as I'm lecturing, you're able to share back with me, particularly if I'm able to see you and have those conversations. 
so that's media richness. And then we talk about emotional impact um, because emotional impact plays a role as well because employees can be affected by various things emotionally. But face-to-face communication helps in a lot of different contexts, in a lot of different contexts. Um, The textbook utilizes... the example of the USDA and which is the United States Department of Agriculture there was an employee by the name of Shirley Sherrod and this was in 2010 and it, the book says she was notified of her expected resignation through text message while she was driving to work so first of all the channel or the method of communication which was a text message alone caused an uproar and shot a lack of disrespect for a long-time employee and so the USDA learned that text messages are not the most appropriate mode of communication and so emotional impact plays a role too Um, USDA learned that it's not appropriate to communicate personnel matters via text message and so you have to consider what is the appropriate method of communication or channel uh, when you're communicating with someone. Uh, For example, and I say this often, group me um, or group text messages is not the most effective way to avoid meetings because sometimes it's still appropriate to sit down and have a meeting. Now, depending on if it's a quick message or something that's not urgent or something that, you know, may not require an instantaneous response or a quicker response, then that may be appropriate. We didn't talk about email because email has become a very driving force in any professional environment. Um, Email has changed uh, the world essentially in how it communicates. We know the post office has taken a huge hit hit as it contains to uh, email. And your textbook is going to go through quite a few uh, more tips and I'm gonna discuss those briefly that the text, that the PowerPoint slides doesn't use. Um, So it's important to do a few things. First of all, in email, be concise. Nobody wants a super long email. We want you to get to the point um, because email, as we talked about in the time management section, uh, can be a heavy distraction, particularly throughout the day. So we need to go ahead, figure out what the main points are and move forward. Use proper letter case. Um, If you type in all caps, we all know that it's under the impression that you're shouting. Um, I believe I shared with the class that I had an instructor when I was in uh, junior high school, which would be considered middle school, well, high school now. Um, I had an instructor and he would type all of his quizzes in all caps. And it was just his preferred way of typing. Um, You know, now that's perceived as uh, inappropriate. But again, you want to make sure, uh, because it's shouting, but you want to make sure that you utilize appropriate case. Use blind carbon, use blind carbon or blind copy and courtesy copy important or appropriately rather, excuse me. So courtesy copy is used to keep others informed Blind copy only should be used when you prefer to keep recipients from seeing who else received a copy of your message. A good example is your textbook talks about you would do this if your email involved issues of confidentiality or the information in it might damage a relationship. For example, suppose you want to let your district manager know how you're handling an employee problem. You email the employee himself to notify him of your plan and you send a blind copy of the email to the district manager. That's one example. Another example is if you're emailing a large group and you don't want everyone to have access to the full group list, you would use BCC so that everybody can't see the full list. They can only see uh, who may be in the two or the copy line, carbon copy line. So remember to use those appropriately. Uh, blind carbon copy shouldn't be used as a common method to do everything. Um, Next, you want to use the subject line. 
give a brief description of what the email is about. Uh, I've seen subject lines that are way too long sometimes in email. Please avoid a super long subject line. Be concise. Let them know what it's about. Subject is good because if you've got somebody that's good with time management too, it helps them to be able to understand what the email about is about. So if it's something that they don't have to directly respond to, they can get back to you um, as time permits. Use correct grammar and punctuation. Again, that's appropriate in all email um, or in all forms of written communication to anyone uh, to make sure you use appropriate grammar, punctuation, all of that, particularly within the business environment. And consider the appropriateness of your content. Um, so for example, forwarding items with sexual or off-color content or for personal use. Uh, so remember that your work email is namely for work-related business. Um, otherwise, you have a personal email for options outside of what's work-oriented. And so you consider the appropriateness of content. Some content is just not appropriate for the workplace and for email. Lastly, you want to make sure that you don't use email as an excuse for you not to communicate through other appropriate channels of communication. So don't use an email to communicate things because you don't want to communicate face-to-face. Face-to-face is still appropriate. Over the phone is still appropriate. Remember, media richness. So email is not, it's, though it's a quick way to communicate things, and to document things, it's not appropriate for everything. And in terms of etiquette rules, so we talked about the guidelines there. Etiquette rules, the two things that are important is that email is effective and professional. Let's jump into the third objective, which is writing business letters. Um, so correspondence does a couple of things. First of all, correspondence refers to business letters sent to customers, coworkers, superiors, and subordinates. So the first thing that it does is it develops goodwill. And that's essentially important for a couple of reasons. First of all, goodwill is a positive perception of the author on the part of the audience. Um, it should be adapted to the reader. And it, you want to send the acknowledgement letter. Um, so those are things that you want to make sure. Um, so the book says, put simply, adapt to your reader. Rather than saying we need to see a receipt before we can process a return or exchange of the merchandise, you could say you may receive a full refund or exchange of the merchandise if you mail or fax a receipt. And so it's clear. It's adapting to the reader. And then in the case, you could build even more goodwill by sending an acknowledgement letter, letting the person know that the receipt arrived and thanking the person for being prompt. And so that is all of that essentially in practice. Um, then you want to include standard elements of correspondence. And a lot of this is within your textbook. There's an example of a business letter on page 219. Um, so... Standard elements include a return address, an inside address, a salutation of body, and a closing. Um, you don't see people writing letters as much anymore, but every so often you need to do them. And a good example of them is if you're applying for a job and you need to do a cover letter. Typically what I do as, as a common trend is... I go on Google and I search up a sample business letter and I look at a template anytime I'm doing it. And I consistently use kind of the same theme over and over again. But you want to make sure that you include those standard elements. They need to be in a letter. The next thing that you want to do is you want to deliver bad news tactfully. So sometimes letters or correspondence are used to deliver bad news. Um, but you want to do a few things within that. You want to open with a description of the context to provide a buffer, such as, and, and the text is going to use the example, if you apply for a position. So it typically starts with, thank you for applying for the position of service manager at TRH Inc. 
So that's your open with the description. Then you explain the bad news. So with explaining the bad news, uh, rather than just simply stating it. So it goes on to say, because of the extensive pool of applicants, we have chosen to place someone in the position with 10 years of experience who will need minimum training to begin. Now, typically, and, and I know your thoughts, so most job letters aren't exactly that specific. And so you can uh, use the appropriate amount of specificity um, within a letter as is dictated by your organization or what you feel is appropriate. But the key is you want to make sure that you're delivering that bad news tactfully and you explain it rather than just stating it. And then you close with a goodwill message that reinforces a positive relationship with the recipient. So the textbook gives the example with your excellent academic record and ability to put others at ease. We have no doubt you will be successful in finding a position with a, another organization. Again, for a job rejection letter, it's oddly specific, um, but again, it creates goodwill. And if a lot of times, if you have seen letters that are more specific like that, yes, it gives you bad news, but then it still, in, in this example within the book, it still gives you, it says, hey, these were the skills that we appreciated about you. And because of that, we know that it would be appropriate in another setting. Lastly, use a standard format. Um, so use a full block or standard letter style. Um, so again, an example of that is in your textbook. Another type of letter that letter that people um, write regularly is complaint letters. Um, so they first of all have specific characteristics. Um, they express dissatisfaction. You say uh, what's wrong with it, and you effective you use effective methods for resolving disputes. So this is what needs to be done. So um, we all know what a complaint letter is. It expresses, it expresses dissatisfaction. Um, so there are some suggestions uh, that are considered um, appropriate when consider using a complaint letter. The first one is complain only when you feel it is justified. Address the letter to the person who has the authority to fix the problem if you know who it is. Because sometimes within organizations, you may not know who it is. Uh, be courteous and professional. Be factual. So don't go off the deep end with your complaint letter. Focus specifically on these were the facts. This is what happened. And this is what it caused. And then state consequences only if previous letters have failed to get the problem corrected. With complaint letters, you don't want to start by immediately saying, you know, I'm going to seek legal action should you not know. You don't want to immediately talk about those things. You want to try to, first of all, use a complaint letter to establish how you feel uh, so that you can go through those specifics and work appro appropriately to get those addressed. Let's discuss the next objective now, which deals with uh, business documents as a whole. So the first one is memos. Um, memos are typically, and you don't see them as much anymore, particularly because now there's a big push to email. Uh, but memos used to be inter-office correspondence. Um, and that's what they were big for. So their characteristics were that they were short. They were usually informal written communication and they were used as reminders. So they didn't spend a lot of time um, going in depth about things. It was short to the point, discuss what it needed to discuss and move forward. Um, they note the sender and the recipient, the date and the subject. Um, so memos were oddly specific. And there's an example of a memo on page 221 of your text. Um, so typically it, it has two, it has who it was from, it has the date at the top, and then it has the subject. Um, and all of that is important. And all the names are included in the two line. Um, and then there was also a carbon copy line. So if you 
were copying someone on it, you would there would be a CC line as well. But you include who all of those pieces too. And a lot of times you saw mem memos weren't signed, but they were initialed beside who the memo came from. Um, the goal within the body of a memo was to keep it under a page. Um, because again, memos were known for being brief and to the point. And then in the closing, they don't require standard signature. You include the notation. So if you have an attachment to a memo, you let people know, hey, there's an attachment here. And then you list people who copy, as I indicated before. So that's not done at the heading, but that's done actually in the body of the memo. You have progress reports and activity reports, um, and this is going to be something particularly if you work in the project environment of IT. Um, in terms of projects and activities, uh, they do a lot of different things. So with a progress report, you're updating someone as to the project, um, as to the progress of an activity. Um, so with the progress, it gives an update up to the status. It's generated by a company that has been contracted, and it includes information about how the work is progressing. Basically, again, short, brief, to the point. An activity report documents and that uh, is a document that communicates progress and achievements. Um, so it gives information on the status of several ongoing projects. It's typically issued regularly, and they don't have a formal structure. So activity reports are these are the information about several projects. They're given on a regular and consistent basis, so we know when to expect them. Next, we'll talk about sales proposals. Um, again, not going to spend a lot of time going in depth about these specifically um, because as you work for an organization, uh, you'll typically see these. Um, but in terms of characteristics of a sales proposal, it's a document to persuade possible clients of their need uh, for your product or service. They highlight specific benefits. So, And this is essentially what you've been doing in some regard with the proposals that you've been doing. You're more internal, so you're basically making a recommendation with the work computer and the uh cloud solution proposal, but some of these things are, are good to include. For example, they highlight specific benefits. What's the benefit of choosing option A or choosing our service over a different one? Sales proposals are typically binding. So once they're created, they're in a lot of cases legally binding, especially depending on what type of industry or field it's in. Um, and then they have guidelines, and their guidelines are to outline the problem, discuss, discuss rather your approach, discuss the benefits, and then mention schedule and cost. Um, so all of that needs to be outlined within a sales proposal. Lastly, you have formal reports, and formal reports do a couple of things. They are, first of all, highly detailed. They're very comprehensive. Uh, typically, after you have some type of major project or even if you're in the midst of some project or getting ready to start some project, you do some type of formal report. They are strictly formatted and the format varies based upon whatever your company's policy may be. Um, the front, they typically have a title page and an abstract. The abstract typically gives you a summary of what you're going to find within the pages. It has a table of contents as well as a list of figures and tables, and it has a forward or a preface. In the body, it typically has an executive summary, um, which is similar to the abstract, but it goes over at high level. You have the introduction, introduction, you have the text, and then you have the conclusions and the recommendations. And then in the back matter, you have your appendices, your bibliography, your glossary, and your index. Um, typically with formal reports, again, they could be going external. That's why they're oddly specific. Um, for example, my institution does a report on philanthropy every year. And so it talks about all the philanthropic concepts and things that the 
uh, university does um, to really make an impact in the community. And so that report is oddly specific. Um, there's another report that I think they do. I don't know the exact name of it, but it talks about economic impact of the university and it talks about, you know, how much money students spend and it talks about how much it pays overall uh, and in a median kind of format, its employees and things of that such. And so all of that comes into play because it allows people to see all of the ins and outs as it pertains to the organization. So it can be internal or it can be external to the unit, to the organization. All right, so that covers chapter 14. Again, a lot of it is more introductory stuff than anything else, um, but it gives you an insight into the component of writing. Um, so I hope that you'll take some of these things and filter them into your proposals. Um, again, the big things are chapter 14 quiz, your practice assignment, and your cloud computing proposal. Now, the other thing that I do need to make sure that you are aware of is, and let me flip this to your view so you're not seeing all these folders. All right, last week you had the work computer presentation um, that was actually, it, was, it would have been done on Wednesday and we would be presenting it uh, today or whenever you're watching this video, we would have presented it on the 21st. However, because I'm not in class on the 21st, we will present it in our next class, which is the 28th. So be prepared to present those. Now, if you do not submit, if you did not submit it on the 20th, it is fine. It does not have to be submitted until the 27th. Um, so just make sure that you get it in Blackboard by the 27th um, so that when we come to class on that Thursday, you'll be ready to present. Again, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. I will be more than happy to answer your questions um, or address anything that you may have. Uh, other than that, I hope you have a great week. Remember to study for your second exam. Your ex second exam will be on next Thursday. So again, I encourage you, if you have any questions uh, about any exam content or anything of that sort, make sure to shoot me an email and I will make sure to respond to you. All right, have a great week and I will see you on in class on the 28th.